Our scripture passage this weekend comes from Acts 12, 1 through 19, and it gives us a little bit of an insight of what it could look like when we follow Christ. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. (laughs) You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. This is the word of God for us. So in our, uh, in our country, in our world, um, who has the power? Where is power found? I guess it uh, depends who you ask that question to. Uh, if you ask it of uh, the folks who are kind of the shapers of culture, the media and stuff, I think they would tell you it's found in the seats of governmental power. Perhaps you tuned in a little bit this week because it seemed all eyes were on the Mueller hearings in Washington, D.C., because that's where all the focus is, because the answer that many would give is, well, the power is in D.C. or other national uh, capitals or state capitals. Uh, One of my commentaries written several years ago says that Americans have almost a religious obsession with the power of the state. We think that's where power is really found, that's where it's at. And I get it. There's a lot of reminders and a lot of uh, evidence around that the, the state has ultimate power. Last month was the 30th anniversary of the uprising in Tiananmen Square. If you're around my age, you remember it, and you might remember this iconic photo from that uprising. This was uh, taken on uh, June 4th, 1989. 
and it's one solitary man in Tiananmen Square, um, unarmed, standing in front of a line of tanks. A gathering had been taking place that had drawn thousands and even tens of thousands of students from across China asking for greater freedom, asking for uh, release from the oppressive atmosphere of uh, conditions there, and they were calling for change. And while the government of China denies this from ever happening, Western observers, many news people, uh, saw it with their own eyes. They unleashed all the power of the state. And thousands upon thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Chinese were killed by their own <laughs> army. This man was whisked away. We don't know his name. His identity has never been uh, uh, clarified. Observers said he was whisked away by the police and never seen again. So images like that, um, stories like that, seem to sort of reinforce this notion that the, the real power is in the state, that that's where the real action is. Um, what if we were to look at it from a different perspective? What if we were to look at it from God's perspective? What if we ask the question of God, who has the power? I have a, I have a feeling God would answer differently. In fact, I know he would. And what we want to do today is we want to look at such a story, a, a different sort of understanding of power. In fact, one, a story that will turn your understanding of power upside down. It's found in Acts chapter 12, and Luke writes this for us. And Luke is also the author of the Gospel of Luke. He writes the book of Acts, which is the story of uh, the work of the Holy Spirit through his people in the early church. Um, and it is a, it's an inspiring story. But this one especially, he tells with great skill and craft. I love good writing. Don't you like good writing? Uh, this past week before, I was teaching a course in Kansas City at St. Paul School of Theology for folks who are going into, into ministry later in life, and they go through this course of study, and, and uh, uh, they had to turn in papers ahead of time, so first time in my life, I graded papers, 38 of them before the class, and uh, some were better than others, and one guy was a, he, he's a part-time pastor, he serves this church on the side in Lubbock, Texas, and he's a full-time journalist, and he, he was such a good writer, I just so enjoyed reading his papers, so I love something that's really skillfully written, and Acts chapter 12 is one of those those um, chapters that is just brilliantly written because here Paul is wanting us to see who really has the power and where power is found. And so um, we're going to wrap up this series on the life of Simon Peter. Now it's been seven weeks, which really uh, doesn't do justice to his life. We left out a lot of stuff. Uh, you can hardly go through the Gospels without running into the Apostle Peter um, on just about every page. And there's a lot in the book of Acts, we, we left out some things. But this is the last significant story from his ministry as told in Scripture. And what a story it is. And here, it's more than a rescue story. It's a perspective from God's perspective on the true source of power and God's wisdom. So who has the power? Well, let's look at this story. In Acts chapter uh, 12, let's reread this. Re -read these verses again. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. This is, this is James in the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Herod is going after the leaders. You cut off the head, you kill the body. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. A little bit overkill. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So who has the power? Well, right there, four verses to sort of 
Luke is, is building this up and saying, here's the predicament that not only Peter is in, but the, but the early church. Herod, with all of his might and all of his power, is coming at the church. Now, Herod was sort of a puppet ruler, but because he was so dedicated, he's also, by the way, he's Herod, he's the grandson of Herod the Great who tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. All right, but he has the power of the Roman government behind him. He may be a puppet ruler, but he's got a lot of force behind him, and so he can pretty much accomplish what he wants to do. And Luke sets this up that, man, the church is in a bind. They just killed one of its key leaders. They've arrested another one of their key leaders, and you've got the, you've got the power of the state. You've got the, uh, the terror of the sword, and then you have the security of the prison. Um like the other Herod who arrested, uh, who had Jesus tried. This Herod, though, is a, he, he knows what happened before with Jesus and that he was put in this tomb and he somehow got out. And so he's a little bit obsessive in what he does here. He has four squads of soldiers. Normally, when a prisoner was arrested, he would be chained to one soldier. Peter is chained to two, one on each arm, and has 16 soldiers guarding him. He wants to make sure nothing happens. Maybe it reveals a little bit of his own insecurity. So yet in one corner you have Herod, his authority, the power of the sword, the security of the prison. And then you have just a, a half of a verse dedicated to what the church had. Look at this. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. All this build up, but here's what Herod has. And then what does the church have? Prayer. That's it? <laughs> That's it? I mean, they're up against Herod who has the Roman Empire behind him. And all they got is prayer? What chance do they even have? I mean, mostly in history. How is intimidation and power and violence responded to? It's met with more violence. You come at we, with, with, a, with a knife, I'll come at you with a gun. And the, the violence just escalates. We see this all the time. We saw it in Tiananmen Square. You know, this, you know, this weekend is the 100th anniversary of one of the worst race riots in American history. Yesterday was the 100th anniversary of the uh, infamous Chicago riots. White turned on black and black responded. Blacks responded. And it was an ugly scene. Thir at the end of the day, 38 people, black and white, died. 500 people were hospitalized and thousands of people were displaced. It was a horrible day in our nation's history. Fast forward 40 years into the future from that day, and in Birmingham, Alabama, you have a young African-American preacher living under the oppression of Jim Crow laws. And he says, I'm going to do it a different way. And instead of responding to violence with violence, he took a page out of the teachings of Jesus who said, if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other cheek. And he put into practice the nonviolence of Jesus, and the world was astounded because it doesn't normally see things happen this way. Violence is always met with violence. Where's the power? The writers of Scripture are constantly reminding of this. Zechariah, the prophet, said, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And then Jeremiah says this. He says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight. Where's power? It's in God. It's, it's in prayer. And you say, well, why pray? 
Does prayer even work? I mean, after all, it tells us in verse 2 that James was killed by the sword. I suspect that the early church, when he was arrested, prayed for him, just like they were praying earnestly for Simon Peter. And yet, he died. So, why pray? Does it even work? Oh, friends, it's not about, does prayer work? What is prayer at its essence? Is it magic, some kind of approaches magic almost like rubbing you know the uh, a genie's bottle something genie's lamp is it that is it, is it trying to manipulate god trying to twist god's arm to get him to do what we want him to do is that what prayer is is it bringing the list our list of things well yeah there's there's some want some aspect of that surely james says you have not because you ask not it's okay to bring a list it's okay to pray and ask for things, but, but is that what prayer is, just that? Oh, it's so much more than that. And what this passage tells us is that prayer is a declaration of dependence. They had nothing else, friends, but they had God, and they could pray, and so they prayed. It was it was a statement of where their hope was. And that's what prayer is for us. Even if we die, we place our hope in God who raises the dead. And so we pray because there's power in prayer and even miraculous power. Um. I've been trying this at the other couple services and I found we're just a little bit rusty, but we have this sort of call response thing that we've done over the years about prayer. And I say, much, pr much prayer, and you respond, yeah, we're really rusty with this. <laughs> yeah, the other services beat you folks, okay? It's much prayer, much power, okay? So I'll say much prayer, you say? Much power. I'll say little prayer, you say? Little Got it, right? What do we, what do we need? much prayer what will we get yeah that's right do we believe that there's power in the name of Jesus and there's power when we come to God in prayer Sky Jathani is an author and editor of a magazine that I frequently read and uh, he, he tells a story about going to Africa specifically to Nigeria and hearing a number of uh, stories people speak. If you know anything about Nigeria, it's sort of at the, um, uh, the boundary between the Muslim world and the Christian world, and it's therefore a place of great, uh, great violence. Many, many attacks upon Christians, and unfortunately some retaliate, and it goes back and forth, and thousands of people have died in this religious violence. Well, he heard an Anglican bishop speak by the name of Benjamin Kwashi. And he's a, a bishop in Jos, Nigeria. And he, he told this story. He said that uh, a mob came to his house intending to kill him, but he wasn't there. His wife was home. And they beat her mercilessly did unspeakable things to her, and left her for dead. The bishop came home a few hours later and find, found her barely clinging to life. He got her to the hospital, and she had a long recovery, but she lived. As a result of the beating, she lost sight in one eye. He says, one year to the day later, the same mob came back to his house, and this time, Bishop Kwashi was home. With their machetes and their clubs, they, they, and in hand, they drug him out of the house and told him they were going to kill him. And he asked if he could pray first. They said yes, and so he fell to his knees in the dust of that Nigerian soil, and he prayed, and he prayed. And a few moments later, he, heard, he felt somebody take his hand. His wife. She pushed her way through the crowd, the same mob 
that had nearly beat her to death a year earlier and stood there in solidarity with her husband and prayed. And as they prayed, a few moments later, he felt somebody take his other hand and he looked up and it was his 18-year-old son. And he said, no, son, no. They'll kill you too. Please go back to the house. And he said, Dad, they're, they're gone. No one's here. To this day, the bishop doesn't know why they left, but he believes they'll come back. I wonder if something happened in the heavenly realms as he prayed. In the month of May, we looked at Paul's teaching about the principalities and powers, the forces that rule the, this present darkness, who are behind the anger and the hatred and the racism and the violence and the, the, the ugliness in our world. And I wonder if those principalities and powers that were at work in that mob saw a man and his wife praying and shuddered and ran in fear. I don't know. Do we believe that there is a God who really answers prayer and moves sometimes in miraculous supernatural ways? Apparently not. Some research was done just a few years ago of American churches. And they asked him, tell us your the, the, the priorities in your church right now. And they were, they were able to list 10. You know that only one in 25 churches, church leaders said that um, prayer was one of their priorities. One in 25. That, that was even in their top 10. Do you not know? <clears throat> Have you not heard? But the Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't grow weary or faint. And his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths will stumble and fall and young men, even youths will grow weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up, on, they shall soar on wings like eagles. They shall run, not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. You're not heard. There's a God in heaven. And he responds to prayer. So where is power? in prayer. We go back to the story. Um, as, I tell, as I said, Luke really beautifully tells this story. So he starts out with the power and authority of, of Herod, and then he, then he go, you know, when the scene shifts to, to Peter, the night before he's going to be tried and prob most likely executed, and an angel of the Lord appears in the, uh, in the cell as the church is praying. And this angel wakes him up and, and, and uh, tells him to, to get his clothes on and put his shoes on and, and to follow him. And, and Peter does. And, and he's kind of in a stupor. You ever get awakened in the middle of the night and you're sort of half awake and half asleep, right? And then someone speaks to you. And then, you, you know, my wife will do that sometimes. And she'll, the next day she'll, remember what I told you last night? I said, no, I have no idea. Was, did you speak to me last night? You know how that is? You ever been there where you're kind of half awake, half, half asleep, right? That's where Peter is. And, and, and so the angel is, is, is uh, speaking all these things to him. But it said that he thinks it's a dream or a vision. So the chains fall off of his arms. They walk through the prison, out of the prison. The gate opens by itself, and he gets about a block away from the prison, and the angel disappears, and he suddenly fully awake, and he says, oh, my gosh, it's true. It's not a dream. So he runs to the house of John Mark, and let's pick that up uh, later. Mark, the same Mark who writes the Gospel of Mark. 
It says, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the entrance, at the outer entrance, and a servant, and the word there is a servant girl, represents a younger person, <coughs> named Rhoda, came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without, op without opening it and said, Peter's at the door. You see, picture the scene, there's a little bit of humor in this. She's so excited that Peter is standing at the door in answer to their prayers that she forgets to unlock the door. She runs in, interrupts the prayer meeting. And they, it says, you're out. And, and their response of these people of great prayer and faith, you're out of your mind. When, when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. That's just his guardian angel. Rhoda, we are praying for Peter's release. Please don't interrupt us anymore but he, he's out there. And finally, she just won't let it go. And he keeps knocking. They decide to check it out, and it says they were astonished. They're praying for his release, and they're astonished that he's released. Why do we do that with prayer? And we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and God answers a prayer. <gasps> Can you believe it? Well, friends, the first century Christians were no different. <laughs> but here's what I love about this story. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, Luke, in order to tell the story, he goes forward a few years into the future. He wants to tell us the rest of the story about Herod. You know, the big tough guy? Let's go. It says here, and Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address in all the pomp and circumstance and all the trappings of power, right? They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. He was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Where's the power? Kingdoms and kings and rulers come and go. But God's work goes forward. And God is the ruler. And his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His ways will prevail. And right in the middle of the story, who's the hero? A little servant girl. She believes. She thinks their prayers got answered. Amazing. A little girl. Rhoda means uh, a rosebud. She's a beautiful flower of faith. You ever noticed that when God really needs something done, he gets the attention of children first. When the priesthood was at an all-time low and was corrupt, Eli was the main priest. God had a message to deliver his people. He didn't go to Eli. He called out in the middle of the night to a young boy named Samuel. And Samuel said, here I am. When a giant named Goliath, was threatening the people of God and sending shutters down the spines of the professional soldiers. It was a little shepherd boy and a slingshot that brought the giant down. When the great um, forward progress of the kingdom was about to happen and God was ready to unleash his great plan of sending Jesus into the world. He first sends the angel Gabriel to the home of Zechariah because his wife Elizabeth in her old age will become pregnant and give birth to the forerunner of the Messiah. And the Lord goes to Zechariah the priest. He's educated. He's, he's, a, he's a religious leader. He should know better. And the Lord says, and, and the angel Gabriel says to him that his wife's going to become pregnant. He says, well, how do I know this is going to happen? And Gabriel said, because you did not believe, you will not speak until this child is born. 
when John the Baptist is born, he, he realizes that God really is a keeper of promises. Well, six months later, after that announcement, the angel Gabriel went to Nazareth, to the home of a teenage girl, and said that you're going to bring the Messiah, God's long-awaited Messiah, into the world. And her response May it be done to me according to your will, your word. Faith of a child. That's why Jesus said, don't hinder kids. You don't hinder children. Um, They believe. Why is that? Why do they believe and we don't? Maybe because we adults have... have, um, been, in, been beat up by the world. We've had too many doses of reality. And somewhere along the line, we stopped believing in the supernatural power of God. Bob Tuttle, whenever he comes to speak, he always tells me, he says, yeah, you get the five and six-year-olds praying because when they pray for rain, they go get an umbrella. God's power is seen in the weak. Got an update from one of our missionaries. We support a missionary in Thailand uh, named Chris Rourke. Some of you may know Chris. He grew up here in Cape County. He is in doing frontline evangelistic work in Thailand. He also does some work in Laos. And Laos is a place where the church is growing but under great pressure and persecution. And in his newsletter, he told some uh, stories about what he encountered when he was there. And he, he told a story about a, a, a new Christian who had become a pastor in a village where Christianity was uh, 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 not looked upon with favor. In fact, his neighbors were deeply angry that he converted to Christ, and so they tried to kill him. They poisoned him with a poison that should have taken his life. He stumbled outside of the village, fell to the ground, but bev- and, and then cried out to God in prayer. And just before he lost consciousness, he was aware that large ants, fire ants, were climbing on his body and biting him, as if to add insult to injury. And then he lost consciousness. He woke up a half day later, alive, only to see piles of dead fire ants all around him. For you see, they bit him and removed the poison from his body, and he lived. Do you believe that? No, oh, they do in the rainforest. They do. Just heard that two weeks ago. I was with an African leader this past week from Zimbabwe. Oh my, his stories! I don't have time to tell you that. God is working and uh, uh, on the move around the world, and sometimes in miraculous ways, and His power is still present, and He moves in response to prayer and children. And so we get back here to the story, and I said, this is the last major story in the life of Simon Peter. And here, I want to read this last verse. It says here, Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and describe how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James, this is the brother of Jesus, not the inner circle, James, who had already died. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. And Peter walks off into the sunset, to the horizon. Oh, he appears briefly in Acts chapter 15 at the, conf- at the council of Jerusalem. But Paul is the center figure there. And so we know from reliable sources that he lived another 30 years. And what did he do for those 30 years? He tended the flock. He watched the sheep. He took care of Jesus' lambs as Jesus commissioned him along the Sea of Galilee to do. And as we've seen in this journey, Peter's come a long way, hasn't he? Remember, when he was on the Sea of Galilee walking with Jesus, he started to sink and he became afraid and cried out in great fear and Jesus saved him. When 
Jesus was arrested and he followed from a distance and came into the courtyard and, a, and another girl, a younger girl, asked him, uh, you're one of them, right? And he said, no, I've never met the man. And three times he denies him for a little servant girl. Fast forward to the book of Acts. He's been arrested. Not once, not twice, but three times. And here the third time, when he's in the prison cell, he is, this is the night before his trial when he will be executed. He is so sound asleep that the word used there, the better word is that the angel has to thump him along the side to wake him up. He's sleeping like a baby and he's going to die the next day. Where did he get this courage? The opponents of Jesus tell, tell us, the opponents of the apostles, it says here at this, his second time he was arrested, it says, when they, the religious leaders, saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. How does Peter go from being so afraid to being so brave and courageous? because he was with Jesus. Do you need, is your life filled with fear? Jesus will give you courage. Are you living just for fish? Jesus will give you purpose. Are you weak? Jesus will make you strong. You see, if you will walk with him, and you will follow closely behind him, you too will be transformed. And the answer is that you're with Jesus. And no storm on the sea, no failure, no matter how great it is, no prison of Herod, no gates of hell will ever be able to prevail against you because you will be given a new power, a new bravery, a new courage, a new purpose, a new strength. You don't need greatness. You need a great savior. Your life, your common life placed in his hands. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for um, the picture we get in scripture of this miraculous transformation of an ordinary man, a fisherman, and the change that takes place in his heart and life. Such bravery. Jesus, we thank you that that same courage can be ours, that same purpose, same strength, so thank you that we can access it by prayer, that your Holy Spirit is with us, that you will never leave us or forsake us, and we can walk confidently in, through life because you're with us. You're by our side. You're our treasure. You're our prize, the center of our lives. Thank you for the great invitation to come and follow you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.